Thank you everyone for tuning in to yet another episode in which I talk about issues related to public transportation. And um, today, um, I thought I would talk a little bit about issues of equal access. Um, are things that in, in American discourse today, things in American discourse today fall under the rubric of the word equity. Um, and uh, now equity can be on a lot of different dimensions. I mean, for example, I, I mentioned access before, so stuff like equal access to disabled people absolutely falls under um, under this rubric. That would be things like uh, um, accessibility um, at uh, at every public transport station, and by and, and measured by um, the cost of provision and the uh, uh, and, and the size of the program that is mostly elevators at uh, elevators at subway stations that is an equity issue, um, um, or, or but there are, um, but there are also lesser known things about um, um, access to people with invisible disabilities that's also uh, that, that's also an equity issue. Um, equity issues can include um, uh, gender issues. It's a very big topic of planning, and uh, it's something that I've seen most emanate out of Sweden and their gender-based planning. Um, and there are people who understand this infinitely better than I do. Um, for example, the, the kind of the example, the, the the standard example they constantly give is that um, women ride public transportation more than men do. Um, this is something where if I get to look at census data on uh, U.S. census data, for example, on stream. You can see that just on commute numbers. You can also see them on not in non-commute numbers. In Sweden, I believe they figured out that sixty percent of people riding public transportation at any given time are women. Men drive more, um, and so the uh, and so um, they should not screw over public transportation and pedestrian infrastructure to make drivers' lives. More convenient, and as a result, when they uh, have to do street disruptions for construction in Sweden, they uh, will prioritize keeping the sidewalk open to pedestrian over keeping the roadway open to um, drivers. That is an equity issue. Um, quite a lot of issues of the harassment um, of um, severe street harassment in certain places, um, which. Often very sexist societies that try to deal with these issues do them via having women-only cars. Um, it, I think it's something that originates in Japan, I'm not sure. Um, but it's something that I also know is a, is a thing in Egypt and in India uh, uh, to deal with the fact that quite a lot of these places in, 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 in urban Egypt, urban India, there's this mentality that um, everyone who is out on the street is fair game. And... Uh, Generally, generally, if you ask most feminists, they would be very reluctant to endorse that kind of solution, mostly because it kind of seeds the public arena to men and then just creates a segregated space for women, but it's not a unanimous view, as far as I can tell. Um, and uh, so that, that is another issue of equity, the issue of um, harassment. And again, I'm, and, and I'm giving examples of extreme levels of harassment that aren't really a thing in um uh in, in western countries or, or in uh or in east asia i mean there's a lot of chikan in in japan but not on the same magnitude as i understand as um the sort of threats that let's say indians or you know tell me about the indian women right now tell me um same things with the uh, accessibility to queer people the fact that um um, Eastern European queers tell me that it is not safe for, let's say, two women or two men to hold hands on the train in Hungary or in Poland. That is an equity issue, and figuring out how to fix that is an equity problem. Is an equity issue. Uh, I will say that um, what I'm told is that it's safe when you're in Warsaw. It's safe when you're in Budapest. It's just not safe traveling to and from these cities, um, like on an intercity train. And uh, but anyway, the, what I most want to focus on today is issues of equal access based on socioeconomic status. Um, so that is income, uh, ethnic, ethno-religious background. Uh, just because it's 
um, essentially heredity. It, it's essentially hereditary. What I mean by hereditary, by hereditary is, is that race is hereditary. What I mean by race is hereditary is that if you have two parents of the same racial background, you will, by definition, be treated as a member of the same racial background. Uh, if there are different racial backgrounds, then it depends on the details of what they are and where you live. But, um, and this is not, and, and note that I'm not making any biological assertion. Um, this is, um, this would be true even for groups where we know that there's no genetic difference. Like, um, we, uh, like, like, I don't know, Catholics and Protestants essentially are ethnic markers at this point. Nobody goes to church in Europe. Uh, and, uh, and the same is, uh, and the same may be true of, uh, let's say traveler populations. As I understand it, they're, um, genetically the same or almost the same as the groups that they, that they are in. But if both of your parents are Irish travelers, you're an Irish traveler. Uh, and this leads to issues of long-term segregation, um, and to issues of long-term segregation uh, as, a, as a big vector of inequality. And this is where it's interesting to talk about transportation, just because transportation gets you between different places. Um, it gets you, oh, uh, what is this? No, you do not get pinned. How the hell do I... One of these is I'll, I'll just remember how I ban people. Yeah, I know that it's possible to scroll. Uh, I never remember how to do this. Okay, so I'm supposed to click the name, this is what I never remember how to do, and... Uh, okay. okay, so let's go back to this. Um, so there are these issues of long-term segregation, uh, with, for which transport matters, because um, it gets people between places. And um, especially in more modern systems of inequality, there tends to be a high level of spatial segregation. This was not the case, I don't know, 200 years ago. Um, and, and even 100 years ago, um, in uh, this is called something that I like plugging, it's called the Poverty Map of London, 1889, um, where uh, the... Um, which is very early data viz, like data viz by hand, uh, which is a map that uh, showcases where, uh, the, the, the showcases the um, social classes in London by where they lived, and this being the 1880s, um, the uh, descriptions use very florid uh language, um, things like um, semi-criminals, and uh, th th that is an expression that is actually used. Um, let me kill my face for a sec. I don't want to remove it, just not show for a moment. Um, so, as you can see, um, so I'm just going to tell you what the colors mean. Yellow Okay, you're not seeing yellow right now because you're seeing the loading screen. But when you see the color, and if it doesn't, okay. Uh, so the yellow color here is the upper class. Uh, the red color is middle class. So um, the um, so as you can see, there are very wealthy areas here. Um, West London, London um, famously had a rich West or East dynamic. 
Um, but it was never, uh, but, but if you've read it in Eric Wobsbaum, uh, who was talking about it in terms of uh, the winds blowing west to east and therefore the rich had the nicer air, um, let's look at East London. This is the point that I'm making, which is that the red middle class scholar is who lives on the main roads, even in, even on the east end. So, um, Whitechapel Road, the residents are middle class, um, and on um, commercial, the residents are middle class. Um, and then uh, the, the back lots behind them are where you're starting to see the poor colors. So pink is poor. Um, I think black is the poorest. Um, so just much. So there is some spatial segregation that we see here. Um, you don't see yellow here. Um, we do see dark blue, which is very poor around here, but we mostly see yellow here, right? Yellow and red. Um, although even then you can find like a random slum right next to Wensmeister Bridge. Um, and then there's um, South London, um, which is again, it's the same mix. The main streets are red. Um, the alleyways uh, are not. The alleyways would be various shades of blue. Uh, so this this has changed over time. Um, so this is um, a late Victorian pattern. The uh, uh, more modern pattern is that, first of all, you just are not going to get random slums here because these areas are very high, are very highly desirable. They're close to... Um, I want to say they're close to rich people, but I mean, more importantly, usually if um, rich people live somewhere, there's a reason, and the reason would also apply here. Um, and um, there's also been some changes, like, um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to remember which neighborhood, I think it was Chelsea, where um, the uh, neighborhood had mostly small, uh, what at the time were considered small, and today would be considered normal size middle class um, apartments. And at the time, it was not desirable because you were expected to have servants. But as um, people start getting enough money that they didn't need to be someone's scholarly made, um, the middle class no longer had live-in servants. And so these apartments became more desirable, I think, as part of the issue. But, um, the, uh, um, but the issue is that, you're, is that by let's say, the middle of the 20th century, it's not really the case that it's going to be middle class here and then poor behind the entire neighborhood is really going to be various shades of working class. Um, nothing as horrific as late Victorian England. Um, Victorian England had horrific poverty, but even pre-world, like, like even World War II standards, let alone early welfare state standards. Um, so that's maybe when it, it, it's much more of a clear segregation between wealthy and, uh, People of the wealthy constantly look down on, um, and, and so um, so the spatial segregation problem again it's more modern than a pre-modern thing. Um, in the United States, um, we can't not discuss race. Um, in the United States. So first of all, in this era, so it would be 1889, practically all black people lived in the South. Um, there wasn't actually that much spatial segregation. Um, there was just constant mob violence against any black person who seemed like they didn't secretly want to go back to being a slave. Um, hi, thanks, Marky. Um, and so lots of, uh, so, so the inequality was not spatial in that era in the United States. Um, it became spatial in the early 20th century. Um, the Great Migration brings black people into northern cities. And by then, there are very clear black neighborhoods. For example, Harlem, um, black people enter an area and immediately the white people just flee. Uh, and often, white people will not rent to black people elsewhere. Um, Harlem actually had higher rents than the rest of New York City. In the 1910s, 20s, it was a much poorer area, um, inhabited by much poorer people. At the time, black-white inequality in the United States was much worse than it is today. However, 
um, black people could not rent, could not really rent outside Harlem or um, a, a slowly growing slate of other black neighborhoods like the 1930s would be bed um, And therefore, they uh, had to actually pay higher rent. They had a smaller pool of um, apartments relative to their population that they could live in. Um, and um, there's actually a paper that I'm going to, that, that I just saw now, that I am going to um, show you guys, uh, which is, please tell me that, here is my research, my, okay, I need to, okay, let me see, uh, um, okay, I'm going to also show you this paper, that's not the, yeah, this, okay. This is a paper that looks at, um, and I'm not going to look for a, um, for a free version right now if this is not free. Um, so just look at the abstract. It's really interesting where um, the uh, large, where the migration of people from uh, New Orleans of Katrina ref refugees did not increase property values where they moved, which you would expect because it's more demand on relatively fixed supply, but actually reduced them uh, because uh, it's uh, because of essentially it's white flight. Um, it's uh, so the so the Katrina refugees were predominantly black, pretty infamously to the point that uh, in the white flight suburbs adjacent to New Orleans, one of them, the, the sheriff or the police, I forget which was, which it was, literally got a posse of armed white guys to stand on the bridge with, um, to prevent black people from getting there. Um, and the, um, so in this case, the, in, you would, so this is the influx actually reduces property values. Um, and, and this is just, there was a lot of demand for segregation. I mean, in this case there still is, but in the 1920s, it, it was much more pervasive. And so, um, there emerged zones that were just where black people were allowed to live. And um, as mortgages became a thing in the 1930s, banks started developing, um, in the United States, they developed redlining. Um, this is something that is often blamed on the federal government because the federal government subsidized mortgages. Um, kind of the standard story of um, the emergence of American um, black ghettos uh, at this point, kind of centers federal redlining, but federal redlining was not a big contributor. The federal government essentially just made maps that showed where banks were already not lending for the most part. So, it's, it's the, government, so the federal government kind of um, formalized this, but it was something that had been uh, developed private sector. Um, and uh, the... Uh, and, and it got to the point that um, the presence of, let's say, a single black family on a block could get it downgraded to a place where mortgages would not be given because essentially it's investing in the neighborhood, not necessarily in the home buyer. And um, so, so this contributed to. So, so, so this is pointing out this kind of special segregation in the United States. It's a 20th century phenomenon, kind of emerging in the middle of the 20th, emerging in the early and middle of the 20th century with the Great Migration, um, with a kind of northernization of racism in the South. The saying was, it doesn't matter how close you got as long as you didn't get too big. In the North, it didn't matter, it didn't matter how big you got as long as you didn't get too close. Um, the South essentially northernized in the 1960s, so both, let's face it, less racism than Jim Crow and lynchings, but also a racism that's much more about spatial segregation. Uh, and uh, the uh, and the class issues in Europe, and also to be fair in the United States, vaguely follow this introductory. Um, the, um, the the sort of middle class people who would live on uh, uh, who would live on um, My Land Road um, or, or on Whitechapel Road, they um, just didn't need to live there anymore. Um, and so maybe, and, and so they just moved away. And um, and over time, um, suburbanization, so because of these neighborhoods, and, and I'm giving the example of East London again, but um, there were many equivalent American examples, just 
I don't think any, I, I guess the Lower East Side, but the Lower East Side depopulated earlier, depopulated um, early 20th century because of the subway. Um, so, so when we're talking about mid 20th century, depopulation of infamously poor neighborhoods, um, this is something that, uh, th- this is something uh, that the people participating in this generally viewed as a positive thing that was happening to them. The sort of people who left from the East End to Essex, um, their lives improved during the move. Um, the, and the same is true of American suburbanization, and this is true as well for um, black flight um, in the last generation or two. I shouldn't say the last generation. Um, let's say in the last third of the 20th century, um, black middle class flight out of cities. Um, in, in the United States, it was um, so. Let's say the black people who were leaving Detroit viewed their wives, not their wives, viewed their lives as improving as a result. Um, and um, and this is not even a demand for spatial segregation, which was, for example, why white people left Detroit in unusually large numbers um, a generation earlier, in the 1950s, 60s. Um, but um, but for, for black people, it was not some kind of demand for spatial segregation from poor black people, um, but rather just Detroit was left extremely ghettoized, like disinvested in, um, with, with um, holding back for a lot of maintenance for a population that was no longer there, um, with very hostile um, state government, uh, and, um, and and the and the result was that um, a lot of people just figured they would look for their fortunes elsewhere. Um, and and, it, and um, one of the insights I don't remember. I don't think Devin is the one who told me about this. It's from older works than her um, in, in gentrification studies that um, in uh, the. Uh, in, the, in the United States in, let's say, 1980s, uh, in, in the 1980s, let's say, New York and Philadelphia, uh, the uh, people who were, uh, neighborhoods that are identified as gentrifying aren't actually seeing displacement. So uh, people who leave these gentrifying neighborhoods, again, in the 1980s, maybe 90s, New York, Philadelphia, um tend to also, their lives tend to improve as a result of leaving. They tend to move to, let's say, higher income or higher job access places. Um, maybe they get a car and then they uh, could just move to the suburbs. Um, the issue with gentrification is that today it's no longer the case. And there are neighborhoods where you do see displacement. That is, um, in the United States, it's just easiest to track by race, but you get the exact same result if you track by any other class marker. Um, that they leave the neighborhood and end up getting to worse places, um, kind of farther away from jobs. Um, and this is a lot of, and this is again something that is, is mirrored in Europe exactly. The um, ground zero for the word gentrification was Islington, and there too, the sort of poor people who left Islington for the suburbs considered their lives to be improved by being able to leave a London slum. Um, it's a much more recent phenomenon than people that the people. Uh, who want to stay, that, that working class people who want to stay in the big city can't make rent and therefore move to a place that's much farther away from where they want to be. Um, and um, this is something where you can talk about EMBSM as a solution, um, but I kind of don't want to. Uh, reason being that for example, is there displacement in Tokyo? Tokyo being a rather EMB place. I want to say I don't think so, but I don't know it in enough detail. And I poked around. Um, and I haven't been able... And, and, and I've been able to find like some stories of neighborhoods that are gentrifying, but I can't tell if it's there, if it's 1970s, 80s gentrification or 2010s gentrification. Um, to, to give the New York analogy of um, where, or where people are moving to, um, actually, Borners, if you're here, I'm really curious if you've seen anything about that. Um, but uh, the the main the, the main issue is that um, it's is that even so in a place that is very aggressively and that I know better, 
Vancouver, they're absolutely in this basement. Um, the main, so I haven't seen a very rigorous comparison. No, not in London. I'm actually curious about um, displacement in Tokyo. In London, I know that I, in in London, I, I mean, I mean, London is the second biggest English speaking economy in the world. With apologies to Los Angeles, your city, you, you do not have an economy. Um, to the extent that New York and London do, I mean, there's, like, I, I don't, like, reading about the social issues of London is not difficult. I'm curious about whether Tokyo is, whether, for example, the same kind of displacement that we see in rich European and American cities is also seen there. I, I will say that in Canada, this does exist. Canada is not extremely MB, but Vancouver builds aggressive... Okay, okay, okay. Because in Vancouver, they also just build more. But um, Vancouver has this problem where they don't build enough in wealthy areas. So in Vancouver, so let's go back to what Devon um, and her um, co-author said, because a lot of it is demand for segregation. Now, in America, it's extremely racialized. In Canada, less so. Um, and uh, the... Um, uh, but anyway, th- but in Canada, a lot of the, um, a-, a lot of the segregation demands are, um, I, I don't know what the best way to explain it is. It's probably, uh, it's, it's classism, but it's, but that's not the interesting aspect of it. The interesting aspect is that racism is people in the, like, is people in the 40th, 50th, 60th percentile of racial privilege, dumping on people um, in the 10th. And um, what we see in Vancouver is not that. It's, um, I, mean, I mean, what would be ignoring race for a moment, which we shouldn't, but ignoring race for a moment, what would be the 10th percentile? It would be people at risk of homelessness. Um, and there isn't much of that. It's mostly 95th percentile people, let's call them Chauncey, or, um, dumping on the possibility of 40th, 50th, 60th percentile people um, are moving in from transit-oriented development. And so this is a completely different kind of politics. Um, like racism, as we understand it in um, rich countries today, um, is the racism practiced by a demographic majority, which is also both politically and economically dominant. Um, I believe this is I believe that this is true in every single developed country um whereas um so um now there are other models out there South Africa for example the demographic majority black people is politically dominant um the ANC is a black party but it's absolutely not economically dominant the white people in South Africa and I don't even remember how many times the average of black people, I believe at least like four times or something. It's horrific. Um, you can uh, have a uh, dominant demographic minority sometimes. Uh, again, I, I can't think of any example of any rich country examples, but um, middle income examples do exist. And um, the um, and classism does sometimes behave this way. So, for example, Margaret Thatcher, uh, the, the, the ideological basis for Thatcherism was kind of racism, but for class. So I, I don't mean that it was not at all racist. It was, but in 1980, in, in the Britain of 1980, not a lot of people think about racial diversity much. I mean, yes, there are people who complain about immigrants. Most people are probably somewhat racist against immigrants, but it's not something they think about a lot. Whereas they absolutely do think about um, poor people to dump on, like people on welfare. Um, now, in the United States, anti-welfare rhetoric has been extremely racialized. Um, in Britain, not really. Britain does not have enough of a racial wage gap for anti-welfare rhetoric to be racialized. Um, in the United... I don't remember if it's in the United Kingdom or in England and Wales, but um, non-whites as of, I think, maybe three years ago, earned something like 1% less than white people on average. And, I mean, yes, there are the, the Indians and the Chinese are wealthier than the most discriminated against minorities, which would be black people, Pakistanis, and Bangladeshis. 
and the um, and and also racial minorities in Britain disproportionately live in London, which is wealthier, and within London there's a bigger gap. But I mean, okay, so the welfare, but I mean, the the British welfare state doesn't just go to people in London, right? The, the British welfare state also goes to someone in um to um to someone in Yorkshire who is almost guaranteed to be white British. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. There is also separately um, NIMBYism, but um, um, yeah. So Vancouver lo- looks like Soviet sprawl. No, Vancouver is not Soviet sprawl at all. So um, Soviet sprawl for so you know this. Thanks, Ricky. Um, I don't know if other people know this, but um, there is a pattern that I think I learned from. Uh, they learned from market urbanism back when it was a blog and not just Stephen Smith. Um where um, you would expect density to go down with distance from the center, but in Moscow, it either doesn't or historically didn't. Let me see if I can catch it on Google, um, on Google Earth. Um, but because there was no um, reuse uh, or any mass knocking down of um, older housing, unless it had been like cleared for like revolutionary purposes or something, um, to um, build something bigger. Um, essentially, there's the Stalin ring, the Stalin ring, the Khrushchev ring, and the Brezhnev ring. And so the um, uh, density centers even increases with distance to, from the center just because of the housing needs. Um, Vancouver is absolutely not like that. Vancouver, um, the issue with Vancouver is that it's very recent transit oriented development. So it's so, so the density is geared specifically based on the needs of sky drains. So first of all, this is how the center of Vancouver looks like. Uh, literally, the origin story of um, mass high... I'm pretty sure this is the origin story of mass high-rise urban living in... Um, rich, in I shouldn't say rich, in English-speaking countries. In rich countries, probably starts with um, Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, although... We can't necessarily have called them rich countries in the 1970s when they started. Um, so yeah, these are commercial towers, but these are residential. Um, and um, then um, there's a lot of uh, this kind of transit-oriented high-rise density that you that mostly follows the stations on the Expo line um, because that's where there's transit access to the core. Um, these areas. So there's a kind of east-west gradient in Vancouver, so red four. Uh, the main, uh, like the industrial jobs would have been around the port and, and around here, around the railroads, at, and around the railroads um, was a big part of it. Um, the, uni- the uni is here, so rich people. Um, and uh, to the point that um, there's a lot of nimbyism against the subway that they're building halfway to the um, uni and they're now looking for funds and if and they would have had them already if their construction costs had not exploded. They would have had uh, to, to, um, to complete construction to um, the uni. And there's a lot of nimbyism here by people who object to the presence of students. Um, so again, it's not Thatcherism because Thatcherism is, I mean, it's not like Maggie ever had a true electoral majority. Um, I love you, Michael Slick. Thank you. Every I'm sure every um, every um, fired nurse loves you for having prioritized your anti-NATO crusade over you know, winning elections. But um, the uh, um, but she still had enough of a plurality um, that it didn't sound completely odious to the point that the liberals could actually say neither one thing nor another, but something in between. Again, Michael Foote did not help, but Michael Foote was not prime minister and Maggie was. Um, I won't say for better or for worse, but let's face it, it's absolutely for worse that she was prime minister. And the um, uh, and, and so the upshot is a lot of it is people in Essex maybe looking down on people who have um, stayed behind on poor people. Um, and this is, again, it's not what the Vancouver NIMBYism is like. The Vancouver NIMBYism is very wealthy. It is it's something that centers very wealthy people. And you can even see it from a satellite view how big the lots are in Chauncey. This is Chauncey. 
these people, I, I think one of them literally called them uh, said, we are the creme de la creme. It's people who literally use that language, which the British stories learned to stop using sometime in the 19, I don't know, 50s or 60s, when they realized that um, they might want one day to win an election somewhere in Britain. Uh and um, the and people in Toronto don't give, they don't give a shit. Consequently, this subway is happening. Thank you very much. Um, there's also I don't remember where here, but there's a part. Um, there's a part here where um, someone screwed up. Um, usually, Indian reservations are only supposed to be in extremely peripheral areas, um, so that um, Indigenous people don't get ideas about belonging to society. I believe it's around here that. Um, for a random reason, there is a reservation with good West Side location, so the tribe just figured they're just going to build um, high-rise transit-oriented development. It's not quite transit, but high-rise urban redevelopment um, with a lot of affordable housing, which all the NIMBYs scream at. I'm pretty sure that if the province actually wanted to, they would find a way to prevent that. And I imagine the province doesn't want to prevent it hard enough. Um, oh yeah, yeah the oh, yeah the yeah the, yeah the expo line was very inexpensive because they had uh, they mostly built an existing right of way like this is an an, a, an old interurban right of way from Vancouver to New West. Um, the tunnel through city center is, a re, um, is an adaptive reuse of a no longer needed ferry tunnel. Like the expo, it, it's often the case that you build the first line very inexpensively. It's the same with the TGV network, and then when it succeeds, all the um, usual trolls come out of the woodworks and demand um, more things, and people get lazy about cost control. Um, but uh, and so the millennial, the millennial line is more expensive, but the millennial line is. Just an L, it's just an elevated line over a major arterial, and then the Canada line is half of that, half cut and cover subway. Um, but, but anyway, um, so yeah, um, the oh, they stopped. Oh, I thought they, I, I thought they, st they thought even in the 1940s and 50s they talked about how they're superior to the clubs. Um, yeah, it does have. A characteristic of making the commutes longer if you don't build in city center. But my point is that in Vancouver, they build a lot of housing, but they don't build in the most desirable areas, which would include the west side. It's changing with um, Canada Line rezoning. Um, Shamsi is probably far enough from uh, where they're putting the subway that they're not going to just med rise rezone it, unfortunately. But um, they're going to rezone a lot of the stuff here. Um, and um, is there a displacement in Vancouver? Yes. So it's mostly not a question of uh, YMPism. Instead, let's talk about the issues about public transport. With public transport, so this is something that, again, I, I'm going to keep citing Devon because she is probably the most important researcher to look at this intersection of um, housing prices slash inequality um, with the transport network. Um, so please read her website, um, read her papers. Um, like literally her job market paper is about, uh, um, it, it is, um, about how if you keep the transit system constant and you can't build anymore, the gains from, um, Yimby rezoning are much smaller than previously believed and, um, actually go into negative territory if you just make, if you, if you just perfectly liberal, liberal zoning rather than just doing small amounts of upzoning because there's just going to be too much congestion. So, um, uh, I mean, you're not going to read the papers on stream. I'm not going to read her papers on stream. I have not read all of her papers, only you know, maybe half of them or something. Um, oh, they're doing private. Got it. Okay, okay. Yeah, fair. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's either metro or, yeah, it's either um, metro or nothing, but for a city the size of Moskva, metro is fine. Hell, for a city the size of Prague, I mean, yes, Prague also has a giant-ass um, tramway network, but Prague also has a giant-ass metro network. Um, but, but anyway, the point is that um, th there has to be access by mass transit, um, 
this axis has to be, um, let's call it right size for the city's characteristics. So what I mean by the city's characteristic is that if you're the size of um, Leipzig, Le I don't think Leipzig needs an U-Bahn. I don't think Leipzig should build an U-Bahn. Um, Leipzig should invest in tramways, it should invest in... Um, it maybe should invest in um, job centralization in the city. This is something that tends to be underrated, mostly because people think of job centralization as evil corporate stuff, unfortunately. But when you have more job centralization in the city, city center is the only location that is equally accessible to everyone by public transportation. And if you let jobs drift into the suburbs, usually they're going to drift in the direction of where rich people live. And this is a big problem in Paris. Um, in Paris... Um, as in London, there has always been this kind of east-west inequality um, in the same directionality, in fact. Um, the, um, uh, I know the origin of this in Paris. Um, in London, it's just because um, Westminster was there, so it encouraged a lot of early wealthy suburbanization. In Paris, it would absolutely not have been Versailles. I can't tell whether this was just a good like, location next to a palace, uh, Champs-Élysées. But um, uh, but again, it's not because the winds blow west to east because this pattern predates industrialization. And also, when there was the most industrial pollution, the pattern was actually weaker than today. In Paris, they were trying to go for vertical segregation, so rich people on the lower floors, poor people on the upper floors. Um, it was never quite as clean as that. There were, I mean, people on the lower floors here were poorer than people on the not sure if the upper floors, but on most floors here. Um, and Berlin, Berlin had the same kind of mix of um, some micro patterns like what I just showed you in London, some east-west directionality, um, vertical uh, circulation, again, rich um, on the lower floors. The most desirable would be the European first, American second floor, um, because then you're not at street level, street level is shop. And you also want, and the most desirable would also be an apartment facing the street, not a back courtyard. And then back courtyards and higher floors are for poorer people. Um, and this kind of gave way to more uniform housing, uh, not uniform housing, uniform socioeconomic level within neighborhoods. Uh, so rich, poor, um, or more precisely rich, poor, like the 12th is not poor. I mean, the 12th has below median income for the city, but the city's median income is insanely high. Like, poor, like the parts of Paris that they would call poor 18th, 19th, 20th, maybe 13th. Um, specifically not the 12th. Uh, but, um, the, uh, but the point is that a lot of the job suburbanization in Ile-de-France goes rich people, rich people, rich people. Um, fuck you. We're going to murder you um, after a uh, after we beat Morocco in the World Cup. Um, how dare you? Uh, you should all be deported, um, as opposed to you know jobs or even to some extent jobs around here. And thing around here, there are a couple of companies in the sea, um, a bunch of new towns that were trying to rebalance jobs away from the city, um, because again, there's idea there's this idea that it's more equitable to have less job centralization. Um, so in the name of that, in France, they kind of try to rebalance Parisian jobs with new towns like Sergi, um, like uh, Roissy Paul around the airport, Marne la Vallée, um, uh, uh, Son is uh, uh, like Kobe, like, no, no, Son, Son, uh, like Kobe, like, like this area, this part of the song, Kobe, every, um, is the uh, is supposed to be the new town to rebalance jobs, um, and the upshot is that essentially it ensured that poor people who largely live in Saint Saint Denis, maybe in the Parisian neighborhoods adjacent to Saint Saint Denis, and um, maybe to some extent here in Val d'Oise, uh, don't really have good job access by public transportation. Um, because they, uh, because they, because there aren't as many, I mean, I shouldn't say there aren't as many jobs in Paris, Paris remains one of the world's most centralized cities for job geography at the scale of Paris's size. 
but a lot of the jobs require them to go through Paris to a suburb, to a different suburb. Um, La Défense, again, is the biggest example, this being kind of the favorite quarter, um, west to southwest. But, um, um, and yes, there are jobs here, but they are kind of far from where the poor people live. They're not, in, like, the jobs are not in Olney. The jobs are not, I mean, they're a little bit in Saint-Denis, but they're, they're not in Olney, they're not in Montoy, they're, they're not... I mean, maybe a little bit in Mosley, but they're mostly in, like way farther out, um, around the, around Euro Disney, um, and unless you live on the RERA, which is not actually where the poorest people live, the poorest people are not due east or northeast, then you're kind of fucked. And um, the and, and this is a big issue of um, inequality of access, in which essentially the government is either deliberately or unintentionally telling poor people stop being poor and get a car. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so what you, so less, this is really not less, more than housing EMBAs, it's really important to make sure that there's a lot of job, um, agglomeration in city center. And this is something where I'm actually going to cite Vancouver positively, which is kind of weird because Vancouver and Paris are probably equally city center centralized when it comes to job geography. Um, but I guess I have higher expectations given Paris, uh, given Paris's model split than of Vancouver. Um, Vancouver, um, because there's a lot of high-rise city center, uh, commercial and not just residential development, um, more jobs are here. Um, and again, I'm saying more, but more compared with what? The answer is more than American cities of similar age to Vancouver, all of which would be Sunbelt. Uh, do I have reading racks on job centralization's role in transit model, um, model split? No, I don't. Ooh, uh, oh, right. There's the, uh, this is, uh, this would be uh, Alain Delto. So this is Marin, which is where I, when, which is where I work, but this is not my program. This is someone else at, uh, a um, mayor named uh, Alain Berto. Um So Moscow doesn't really have uh, a density gradient. If anything, the density gradient is not what you would expect. Paris has what you would expect. Um, and if you're wondering why literally one kilometer from city center, the density is lower even in Paris, because this is not where people live. This is where people work or um, do retail. Um, so you should not expect... So in, in Paris... I think the first arrondissement actually has the lowest residential density. Likewise, in Tokyo, um, Chiyoda has the lowest residential population density of any ward, at least any of the special wards. Maybe there are some really outer, outer suburban wards that are less, because Chiyoda is the Imperial Palace, the train station, Akiba, and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of office towers. Um, a few people also live there, but for the most part, it's places that people who live nearby work at or shop at. Um, and um, by the way, Vancouver would not have that great interest because there's so much high-rise residential stuff um, um, adjacent to city center. Um, but the point is that in Vancouver, um, it's actually possible for someone doing a random working class job um, maybe it's not if the, if the work on job is to clean someone's apartment, then they would just work in that person's apartment. Or if they're a barista, then they work wherever. And, and, I, and I have met people in Vancouver with these kind of bum commutes. Like a an Indian reservation, for example, like a really up their Indian reservation um, to uh, kicks. That would be, yeah, it's an hour, an hour and a half um, by bus. Right. Um, but when I say, but so, but a lot of, the, but a lot of jobs that are not inherently neighborhoody, like being a barista, um, like say, um, for example, I know someone who works at a call center. Now, in the United States, the call center is not going to be in city center because there aren't enough jobs in city center. American cities do have high rise um, office towers, but um, American cities the size of Vancouver do not have as many as Vancouver. Um, so Vancouver actually has a lot of job concentration in downtown. Um, and if it's not downtown, it might be, um, um, a lot of stuff would be, um, around, um, central Broadway. So city hall or, um, uh, or Vancouver general hospital would be around here. So, um, it's also pretty centralized jobs. 
Um, and so in Vancouver, the call center, the, the, the call center worker I knew worked somewhere in the financial district. Um, and so this is another form of equity, which is again, it's, it's kind of a form of equity that isn't very, uh, honestly, I have no idea, but you can obtain the same result regardless of where you pick, regardless of any reasonable spot you pick. So um, in imagining they would have picked, I'm imagining that they would have picked Le Al, but it's also plausible they picked Notre Dame, which is um, 0 0.0 for um, road distances um, out of Paris. Like when, when road, you know, when road sign says, uh, when a road sign says, this many kilometers to Paris, this many kilometers to Lyon, whatever. Um, the uh, um, there's a point in the city that is considered kilometers. They were in Paris. I believe it's in front of Notre Dame. Uh, I doubt that it would have been the actual peak job concentration, which is not at either of these places, but a little bit to the west around the opera. Um, I believe that either way you can make the same re the same result broadly whole. Um, so anyway, the point is that um, in Vancouver, um, it's again it's a, it's a very glaring corporate presence. But again, the alternative, but the alternative to that kind of corporatization is not um, socialism. The alternative is the American way, where um, the call center worker is going to be shunted to an office park in a different time zone um, in a lower wage state, and then the city center uh, headquarters is going to be reserved for the actually important people at the company. And um, the, so, so there's that kind of equity angle, which, again, something that the EMB's talk about very much because EMB is very much center housing and not um, commercial redevelopment. Uh, but also, but it's equally important to make sure when you build this, when you build this, this city center, that there is good mass transit there. And Vancouver did everything at once. So it built that. So the Expo line um, is 1980s. It uh, opens 1985-6, I want to say. Um, and this is part of a of a comprehensive plan. It's really important. Now, this is something that Alain Berto doesn't like very much. Alain Berto is very much against central aid planning. He's wrong. Um, but um, the um, so so the example of Vancouver is not it's not order without design. Quite to the contrary, it's order with design. At the same time, in the seventies and eighties, when they essentially decided how they wanted their city to look, um, and realized that maybe they didn't want the city to look like um, I don't know Austin, Texas, um, they built all of these things simultaneously. So um, they rezoned for high-rises, residential and commercial, in downtown Vancouver. I believe the growth starts in the 1970s. Um, and Burnaby. So this is Boundary Road. So Vancouver, Burnaby. Burnaby began as a suburb of Vancouver. So they didn't think about what the center would do because it's just a suburb. Um, so in the name... So this is, this is a rare example of where they're trying to be polycentric in a way that actually works um, they tried to figure out where the center, where the where they would build a city center for for Burnaby, and the Expo Line was being planned already. So they picked a spot on the Expo Line, um, which they called Metro Town. This is Metro Town. You can see it. Uh, I believe this is the second busiest stop on SkyTrain. Um, I think there's a census tract here with 50% model split, which might actually be the most the, the highest in all of Canada. Um, New West was a, an independent city within the Vancouver orbit, um, but did not have much of a city center so or much of a high-rise one. So they built up, knowing the Expo line was going to was being built, they built up these um, um, shopping malls and, and high-rises. Um, Surrey, I don't remember whether Surrey made the decision immediately after <coughs> or, or much later, but... Um, so the actual line opens to New West in 86 and then to Surrey in the 90s. And um, Surrey doesn't do as much TOD. They take a number of town centers to develop, of which um, the one uh, on Skytrain Valley is probably the most important, but it's not 
anything as dominant as New West or Metro Town. So now that Surrey demands money for, I don't even know what they're going to do. If it's going to be um, actual BRT or pretend BRT or or streetcar to Guildford and Newton, um, and also build a Skytrain extension elevated um, over uh, elevated over Fraser Highway to Langley. Um, and so this was very much order with design, and um, at the same time, they started doing a lot of residential TOD, never replacing single-family houses, as far as I remember, but o- always finding spots that didn't have them, maybe because they'd been industrial or something, or, or warehouses, um, and, th- and just building high-rises near the Skytrain stop. This is very much order with design. Um, and, yeah, and, and yeah, that's exactly, that's Bertolt's theory, I'm just, and... There is a lot to Bertolt's theory, just that in practice, it does not emerge without some kind of design. Bear in mind, the design can be a commit, a top-down commitment, as in Japan and South Korea, not to permit local governments to engage in too much exclusionary zoning. Um, but most people who think that it is immoral to do top-down action and think bottom-up is more moral... Um, also believe that um, for a national government to insert itself into local zoning is um, unbelievable tyranny. Um, and so anyway, with public transport, you need you need to build it. You need to build it and, and think about how you're going to build city center just to make sure that you're not going to be in a in the situation of I don't know Dallas where you build a giant light rail network, but it's without any connection with development, and therefore there's no city center centralization. Uh, I think Dallas has about the same CBD size as Vancouver. Vancouver is a metro area of two and a half million people. Dallas, I think, just crossed eight million. And uh, and it's not even developing the, the, the Dallas CBD. The main demand, even before Corona, was... Uh, um, was residential. Um, there was a high um, office vacancy because cars. I mean, if you're a driver, you don't need to work in city center. Um, so that's the main. That's the main issue with with this. You need to um, coordinate the planning, but then you need to take a step further and think how you're going to build a public transit system that is equitable. So I don't just mean build an equitable region and then build a public transit system there and in, in the same way that the Moscow, uh, in, in the same way that the, in, in the same way that the metro in Moscow and St. Petersburg was socialist because it was built by socialists. I mean, the early parts of it, at this point, it's, I guess, Putinist. Um, but I mean, in a, in a way that actually promotes equal access. And again, we're talking mostly about issues of socioeconomic equality. So, um, Things like levels of education, ethnic background, um, immigration background, just pure income. And for this, um, you really need to think in terms of universal design. Um, yeah, TOT is just the realization in select areas. Okay, how do you select these areas? Um, this is why TOD is liberalization. It, it's 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 kind of it's one of these things where it's like a regulation of, with negative costs, which always breaks people's brains. Um, in the United States, the liberalization of uh, car body buff strength rules, like how heavy they need to make the passenger trains in the mid 2010s broke the brains of the incoming Trump administration because it was essentially a new regulation, but also a new regulation with negative cost to the industry. Just because because that concept broke their brain, delayed the process by about 18 months until they realized, oh yeah, that's not actually a net new regulation. It's if you squint your eyes, we can sell it as deregulation and therefore not have to repeal to regulations to pass it. And that's when it passed. Um, a lot of it is just quality of regulations rather than just um, trying to import terminology about liberalization or deregulation that comes mostly from price caps and labor regulations. Um, 
like industrial safety regulations are profoundly different from labor regulations um, that they've kind of ideologically been collapsed into one thing is analytically rather terrible. Um, but, but anyway, um, so what I mean by you need to make the transit system itself equitable, um, you need to make it universally accessible. You can build an amazing mass transit network by the state of physical infrastructure and then price it in a way that the working class can't access it. Um, and then you're called the Delhi Metro. The Delhi Metro um, has rather disappointing ridership for the city's size. Um, and I'm not going to say it has low ridership. Not, I'm certainly not going to say it has low ridership while living in fucking Berlin. Um, they are saying it's, it's kind of weird what they're saying about daily ridership because I guess this is uh, this would be with Corona reductions. Economic survey of Delhi. Let's let's poke around for and, and hope that this link has not died. Okay, this looks like a live link, which is impressive. I actually, don't think I've seen dead links out of uh, out of uh, um, India. Um, also, this is inauspicious. There, the one that the tube does not carry 1.8 billion passengers. It carries. I think 1.3, 1.4. Um, Pre-corona, it's growing, but I mean, again, pre-corona, but a little behind Paris and New York. Um, it's possible they're lumping in something like overground or something. Um, ridership, of course, is mostly Asia Pacific. Um, I don't know whether they're just counting things that count as metro or things that don't, but metropolitan Tokyo is about 14. Europe, Metropolitan Tokyo, um, uh, Moscow, okay, so this would be from UITP, all of the other numbers seem legit to me, so, okay, actually this might be a little bit too high, um, oh, maybe this includes this plausibly includes path. I don't think New York actually ever hit 1.8 recently. I think they peaked at 1.7 something. But the numbers, the rest of the numbers look legit. But the point is that New Delhi, which is not actually New Delhi, it's Delhi, um, uh, has um, about the same ridership as the New York City subway. Now, Delhi is about the same size of city as metropolitan New York. So, um, that by itself is not god awful. What is god awful is in New York, about 30% of metropolitan residents get to work on public transportation. Most of them are on the subway, some are on commuter rail, or on, or on buses, on path, which I'm pretty sure is included in these figures. Um, Everyone else drives. I mean, not everyone, but I think 50% drive. Now, I can tell you with a fair amount of certainty that it is not possible that 50% of Delhi residents drive to work. Car ownership in India is not that high. So how the fuck are they expected to get to work? Um, and often it's things like um, informal or semi-formal transit, um, buses that are not priced as much as the metro. Like the, the metro fares in India are really high. India has an extreme level of hate by the elite. And when I say elite, I don't mean members of the Lok Sabha, um, of the party you didn't vote for. I mean top 5 to 10% of society um, toward everyone else. Um, and this is something where I'm making a point about income. There's, I mean, in India, there would also be um, casteism. There would also be... Uh, uh, Rate, um, ethno-racial inequality on the basis of religion, that is to say pogroms against Muslims, or on the basis of language, i.e. the kind of creeping Hindiization um, of India, this kind of idea that um, if you're speaking Tamil and English, you're less Indian than someone who speaks Hindi. Um, but, um, the, but, but for the purposes of public transit access, in urban India, it would just be income. Um, there is a 
there is an urban caste system in India, don't get me wrong. It's much weaker than the rural caste system. Um, and the lack of access is, um, at least based on the critics that I read, it's not that, let's say, they're trying to go around an area that is a well-known Dalit ghetto. I don't even know if Dalit ghettos really exist in India. Um, at least the sort of critics of Indian inequality that I've read on the on, on this don't mention this as a as a social problem. Uh, and um, instead, they just charge excessively high fares. By excessively high, I mean relative to the rest of the public transit network, in particular relative to the commuter trains. Now, Delhi does not have very strong commuter trains. Mumbai does. In comparison, the Mumbai Suburban Railway operates this and gets 2.6 billion passengers every year, Delhi 1.8. Um, the Mumbai suburb, so the locals in Mumbai, the Mumbai and Delhi are the same size of city, so the fact that Mumbai beats Delhi with an antiquated system like the suburb, like, like the locals, is an indictment of the Delhi model. Um, now, the, now, Mumbai follows the same model. Um, in the, the Indian middle class likes how the trains in Delhi are nice and don't have, um, you know, poor people. And um, so that is being exported to the rest of India with similarly lackluster results. So it's this kind of awkward thing where they're building massive quantities of urban rail, mostly elevated. Their construction costs are too high for a mostly underground system, but that's fine. I mean, the fact they're capable of building elevated does make it affordable for them. And um, and while their costs are high, um, there, again, when, when you build elevated, the costs in India are still, are, are at least affordable to the government. They aren't in Bangladesh, they aren't in Pakistan, both of which are much worse at this. Um, Bangladesh privatizing infrastructure to Japan, Pakistan, to um, its colonial overlord, the People's Republic of China. And um, the upshot is that um, the lack of fair integration is creating an apartheid transit system. In, in India. Um, the poor get to ride horrifically overcrowded, dangerously overcrowded locals where available, for example, in Mumbai or I think in Calcutta. Um, right of way that should go to uh, the locals instead goes to metros. Um, Calcutta has a really uh, bad example that is actually visible as soon as there's no level loads on Google Earth. Um, so Kolkata um, does not have one intercity train station the way is the, the uh, in, in the mode of most newer cities. It has like in like older cities, often in Europe, multiple train stations. Twit two, um, one going east, one going west. Now, um, uh, so you have so there is um, Hara. And so there's Hara to point west and Salda to point east. And um, the approach is, and each essentially is a bunch of different lines, one going north, one going south. This layout screams, it screams as loudly as um, a uh, Muslim who is being set on fire in a pogrom because um, some uh, because some local notable who of course was BJP um, thought he saw him eat beef once um, build um, a tunnel build a regional rail tunnel a four track regional rail tunnel between Hara and Sialda two tracks connect the tracks going south of um, Sialda to those going north of Hara. Two tracks connecting tracks going north of Sialda to two tracks to the tracks going not quite south, let's go to west of Hara. It screams, it, it screams, build me. What did they build here instead? Standard gauge metro. Um, and now, in case I'm just, do you think I'm just dumping on India? The Paris metro exists because of the same kind of classism. Um, the Paris metro. I mean, it was not built on a different gauge. It was built on standard gauge, and France is a standard gauge country. Um, but it was built incompatible with uh, the commuter trains on purpose. Commuter trains were for, the, were for the suburbs. Suburbs are for the poor. The city does not want suburban accessibility. And therefore, they built um, an apartheid system in 
um, early 20th century Paris, um, where the metros, for example, run on the right. Um, French railways run on the left. Actually, most of the world has railways that run on the left because, um, so every, I believe that everywhere where cars run on the left, trains also run on the left. And then um, in, uh, I believe in China, where tra- um, cars, in China, cars run on the right, but I'm pretty sure trains run on the left. Um, this is also the case, I know for a fact, in France, and I think also in Switzerland, it's like small, but France. Um, I'm pretty sure the main places that have um, trains running on the right are just Russia and Germany. Would I say that Hanoi suffers from the same issue? I have absolutely no idea. Um, I assume the subway ridership in Hanoi is horrible because they've literally just opened it. Um, so I don't like I don't know Vietnamese urbanism well enough to tell you um, what. Uh, uh, what their problems are. Um, I know, I, I mean, I can t- I, I can see the problems with um, construction costs and I can even see um, some media reporting complaining about that and then I can maybe see what they're complaining and pattern match to places that, that I'm more familiar with, but I cannot tell you what the situation in Hanoi is. In India, I know more just because I'm reading enough Indian left-wing and neoliberal critics on um, to see what the problems are. Um, and again, it's not that India is doing something nobody's done before. India is screwing itself over in the exact same way Paris did in the early 20th century, essentially forcing itself to build a completely incompatible RER network at very high cost in the 60s and 70s, as opposed to just being able to extend the lines farther out and like connect them to some commuter lines in, the, in what would become the Japanese way or in what was at the time the British way. Um, okay, that is just embarrassing. That is just embarrassing. Um, oh, wait, um, another sanity check. Um, do you know when the numbers that you have on Hanoi Metro ridership are from? Because if there was a, because if it happens to have coincided with a corona lockdown, then it would be, um, artificially suppressed. But anyway, um, so you want to avoid this kind of transit apartheid. And of course, the United States has transit apartheid, just the opposite kind of transit apartheid, where the commuter trains are held for the rich and the subways are not. And literally, there was a transit center report on this that I wrote a not very long blog post describing where they're talking. So they're talking mostly about fare integration. Uh, I'm pretty sure I also link to this in the previous video um, or one before it. But um, so they're talking about commuter rail modernization, but they have a very equity-focused angle to the point of using the expression let, um, Latinx um, and talking about uh, accessibility to jobs by mass transit in the New York region. And one of the things that kind of surprised me when I first saw, but then on second thought, maybe it should not have been surprising me, uh, the uh, access to public to access to work by public transit um, in the New York region is actually better for racial minorities and for poor people than for um, the white middle class. And the reason is that the white middle class disproportionately lives in the suburbs and uh, therefore has relatively poor transit access because maybe they can take commuter trains, but just to maintain Manhattan um, because a lot of them have also suburbanized their jobs. Um, and again, it's these suburbanized jobs that are the most inaccessible if you can't afford a car. And um, so so essentially you need to re-urbanize your job geography and this requires you to, um, to build more public transit. But again, it needs to not be transit apart. You need to have fair integration. Um, and unfortunately, in the name of equity, a lot of American cities are actually going back, are going backward on this. Um, DC, Washington DC just made the buses free. Uh, not the metro. Um, the buses were already cheaper than Metro. There became this kind of culture of poor people ride the buses, richer people ride the Metro. Um, Boston is trying to make the buses free. In New York, people are talking about making the free buses, uh, making the buses free. And like, and 
people I respect um, start saying things like people don't use the buses the same way as the subway and therefore they should not charge the same. No, people don't use this the same way because there are parts of a system with a hierarchy in which the subway is in which the subway is um, more central than the buses, but this doesn't mean that the buses should be free. It means that you should have absolute fare integration. You should also fold the commuter trains into this. And it's a big problem of transit apartheid where, um, unfortunately, um, all the main factors through which equity is supposed to be um, furthered in the United States is kind of local civil rights um, agitation, and this tends to not be very good at systematic thinking. Um, I mean, probably would be argued that the mechanism through which equity is furthered in the United States is not at all. Um, the black-white wage gap in the United States has essentially been the same since 1970. Uh, income inequality in the United States is actually up since then. There was a big rise in the Reagan era, a smaller rise in the 1990s. Um, there has been income compression in the last couple of years, mostly corona compressing incomes a lot, but not nearly enough to like, even go back to mid-90s levels of inequality, let alone 1970s. And um, the um, and, and certainly there's kind of idea that universe, like, so in the, if you look in the right place in the United States, you will see people talk about universal design, um, mostly in the context of um, access to disabled people. So, um, the idea is that the, the traditional way of doing accessibility is to get around obstacles and uh, universal design is to eliminate the obstacles. So this means instead of having random steps in public infrastructure and then a ramp, you just make sure to not build it with steps. Um, it means elevators at subway stations as opposed to paratransit. Um, it means uh, trains, instead of having conductors help people in wheelchairs onto a train. It means level boarding with um, gap fillers so that people can just board unaided. Um, and I haven't seen any of that mentality, unfortunately, doing anything related to um, social economic or, eth or, or, racial, or racial equality. Oh, okay, yeah, that's, that makes sense. All of this makes sense. Um, I will say that in Asia, they haven't figured out bus rail fare integration at all, even in places that are generally good. Like Taipei, for example, doesn't charge the same fares on buses and the MRT. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying Taipei has the best public transit system in Asia, far from it. But um, in, in Singapore, I think they did fare integration, but I think it was maybe 12 years ago. So when I lived there, they did not have fare integration. The buses were cheaper. No, Singapore has fare integration, but it not it didn't have it when I lived there. Um, buses were a little bit cheaper than the MRT. Um, it was somewhat contentious to transition to a fully fare integrated system where all that matters is the distance. Is distance based travel? They don't have um, season passes. They in theory have a monthly pass in Singapore, but it is island wide. Uh, as opposed to zonal or, or station to station as in Japan. And even relative to the full extent of the MRT, it's not a good deal. I think it's, I think it costs something like 50 ish um, times the longest possible trip you can make on the MRT or something or some kind of bullshit like that. So why would anyone use it? Um, like I guess Japan has monthly, but I, but other than that, I don't think Asia is a place of, Monthly, like they, the, the fare systems are different from what they do here. Um, so, so anyway, the um, so you absolutely need to do this kind of integration, not just of fares, but of design. By which I mean, you don't create a situation in which buses are for the poor, trains are for the rich. Um, when you let's say design a suburban commuter rail hub, because what you should be doing is having an integrated system where the buses converge at the commuter rail hub in, in the town center. And maybe I'm giving a Northeastern United States or Chicago era, uh, Chicago area, or to be honest, even Caltrain theory um, example. But I mean, it's practically all American commuter rail is Northeastern, it isn't the Northeast or Chicago. Um, and so what they should be doing is setting these up as town centers with buses that are not just time to connect to each other, but also to the commuter train. 
on let's say half hourly clock face schedule in the bot in in the place where I've worked this out in the most detail, which is the Boston suburbs. They're called gateway cities. They uh, which is a euphemism that became kind of universal within Massachusetts discourse for um, historically urban areas that are not very wealthy. So things like Worcester, uh, Lynn, uh, Brockton, um, I think Plymouth is a gateway city. I'm not sure. Um, Haverhill, Lowell. Um, and um, these are not served by the usual city buses of Boston, except I guess them. These are served by their own little agencies that because they only serve poor people. Um, the managers never use the system. They don't intentionally, but they unintentionally look down on the people they serve. Um, so, for example, um, uh, um, battery electric buses are a really good example of this. They're unreliable. Um, in a wealthier area with unusually wealthy public transit ridership, which um, the suburbs of Minneapolis, where it's mostly commuter buses for middle class white flighters who are working in Minneapolis but wouldn't dare live there because there might be black people. Um, um, so there, they experimented with a battery electric bus, and it was completely unreliable in winter, so they decided not to buy them. Worcester um, is not a commuter suburb. There are some, there is a little bit of that, that kind of white flight commuting pattern into Boston, but most of Worcester is not like that. Um, and so the profile of bus riders in Worcester specifically is very low income. And, and also the commuters would be doing it by train, not by um, not, not by freeway, not, not by highway bus. And so the and, and so the and so in Worcester, um, when the bus when be, if the uh, battery buses were unreliable in winter, they just kept them. Who cares? The riders, yeah. If the riders want to have a reliable system, they should stop being poor. That's kind of the mentality. And um, and again, it's not an intentional mentality, but in practice, is how the managers behave. Um, essentially, they're telling the riders constantly to stop being poor. Um, and so, uh, and, and so the idea that there should be some kind of integration of bus and rail planning that in a place like Worcester, Framingham, or, or, or Brockton, the buses should actually time a connection to the train with um, with integrated fares. That I mean, I shouldn't say nobody in Amer in the American equity sphere thinks like that because transit matters is kind of embedded into that, but it's just transit matters, and this is something that very much came from the more technically literate side of it. And um, the, so, so that is a really important insight that you need to have universal design to, to use fair integration, to use schedule integration, to stop thinking of each mode of transit as its own little thing um, for its own little group of people. That is a really important kind of universal um, design, which is important both for access by income, but also um, when you have issues of spatial um, segregation. Essentially, you want the public to cast the widest possible net, and that means building one transit system, and yeah, there are people who want to buy exclusion. I, I showed you the paper by, um, I, I showed you um, the paper by Devon on that, and there's also a like, very obvious narrative of white flight that just standard factor of American of post-war American history. Um, likewise, you have the exact same problems in Canada. I mean, in Canada, again, it would not be 50th percentile dumping on the 10th or 20th, it would be 19th on the 15th. So, it's, and so they're easier to just bulldoze. Um, in Germany, we have kind of the same issues. Some of it is racial white flight. Some of it is kind of older middle-class white flight from the, oh my God, the city elects socialists to power um, types. And um, the and most of these people are, are but most of these people most of these people are driving. Um, like you can't attract them with an exclusive with an exclusive system. What you can attract them with is with a strong city center and a good train. Um, this does happen in Munich. Munich. I mean, the suburbs of Munich are inhabited by assholes, um, but assholes would still take the S one. And the S one is not exclusive. That one is on the same fare system as everything else. In the city, same as the Uban, same as everything else. Good urban frequencies. Um, for the record, the Transit Matters uh, proposal doesn't have the problem. The Transit Matters proposal proposes um, fair integration, but the frequencies they're proposing are half hourly, which in New York City is kind of 
laughable. Just sad because it's a really good proposal otherwise. Um, so, so, the, so that's the point. Like, you, you need to build this kind of mass transit network. And you can build it to a strong city center as a matter of equal access to work, even if it might look distasteful if it's just big corporations. It doesn't matter. I mean, you, I mean if you want to be Marxist about it, you'd rather be capitalist and feudalist. Um, and um, I mean, you also shouldn't be Marxist about it, but if. Um, and you want to make sure the public transit system is universal. Um, it means... Um, Fair equalization means fair integration. No, I mean, no bullshit about some people ride buses, others ride subways, other ride, others ride going trains. No, one system for all. Um, it means um, uh, it means that also because one system for everyone, this one system for everyone should um, have good internal connections, um, including intermodal internal connections, bus rail mainly. Um, these are like the main insights of this. I mean, um, and again, you really need to think in terms of universal design um, and not in terms of special dispensations uh, because special dispensations are just, I mean, you're going to get paratransit quality, which is extremely humiliating. Um, I have, I'm going to take questions for a couple of minutes and then stop. I can't tell if you guys are hearing the background noise, which um, it was just an emergency vehicle. Looks like an ambulance. So I'll give people some time to type questions, and if not, if there is too much feedback, we can add this at 8.50 maybe, or an hour and a half of recording in our 14th stream. It feels weird to me when the viewer number jumps right as they end. All right. Um, if people don't have questions, we can end this. Um, thank you for watching. Um, I will. Oh, will the embargo on the the embargo on the New York case? lifted last month it's like literally a courtesy and it's going to like it's going to be i mean there's some additional feedback that we're asking and not yet getting um you should expect everything to be released this month um and yeah thank and thank you all for watching um and i will see you most likely on tuesday with another video topic dvd so ciao, ciao and uh and thank you